Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Heidi Hartman. I'm a senior research economist at the Institute for Women's Policy Research in Washington, D.C. I'm very happy to welcome you to our uh, webinar today, the last in our spring series. We are running this for a project on um, all the ways that policies for working families help families uh, economically and health-wise, which is funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, we are doing the project jointly with the University of California at Berkeley. My co-principal investigator is Will Dow there. And we also thank the Urban Institute for their support in uh, publicizing these webinars. Today we have a wonderful panel of, of four people, and I'll be introducing them each individually just before they speak. But uh, just to give you an overview, Dr. Rita Hammond from the University of California at San Francisco. John Iceland is from the California Policy Lab at UC Berkeley. Adam Rubin uh, works for a economic security project in California, I believe. And Otis Rowley is with the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, you'll be hearing more from them, and I'll introduce them more uh, properly later. Um, we want to uh, just point out to you that the topic today is Work Supports and Health, the Earned Income Tax Credit. It's a fantastic program that's 45 years old. I'm going to give you a little bit of background about it. So uh, could I have the next slide, please? It is designed to uh, reward work uh, for low-income people. It provides reduced taxes or cash benefits to working poor and near poor adults with and without children. And because it helps lower earners, it disproportionately helps women and people of color. It is now 45 years old, and it is one of the largest anti-poverty programs that we have in the United States. It's been expanded several times, uh, most recently to uh, families with two or more children and to single adults, perhaps a bit before that. Uh, there were 22 million working families and individuals who received benefits in 2018, and the average benefit for a family with children, and this includes both married couples and single parents, was about $3,200 in 2017. Uh, with child care tax credits and also SNAP, our uh, food assistance program, uh, it does raise a lot of families out of poverty and a lot of children. I think we're ready for the next slide. Now, this is an illustration of how it works. You, um, if you earn nothing, you get nothing. That's that zero in the lower left corner. This is an illustration for a married couple with two children whose household earnings is $20,000. This puts them in the range where they got the maximum credit in 2019, uh, $5,800. And that range lasted a little bit, maybe a few thousand dollars. And then it started to decline pretty steeply the value of their benefits. And these benefits, as I said, will come either in cash or and reduce federal taxes owed. Uh, the phase out it happens at about, oh, not quite $60,000 uh, for married couples. And in the next uh, slide, we can see how it works for a, a single mother with uh, two children. Uh, sing could be a single father, too, excuse me. It's just that the vast majority of such families are single mothers. Um, she can also be eligible for the maximum uh, EITC credit, but the range of income in which she can be eligible for that, because it's only one earner in the family is a little shorter, and her um, benefit will phase out more quickly uh, in the uh, high, in the low 50s, in the low 50 thousands. Um, it's the same um, phase out rate, though, as with married couples. And then the next slide, we, we can look at what happens to an individual. So an individual um, who has the same household earnings of $20,000 is beyond the range at which she or he is eligible for the EITC. And uh, that range, appear, the maximum appears to be less than $10,000, and it's just only about $550 a year. And this is the federal credit that I'm describing here. We also see that a number of states have uh, credits. Can we look at the next slide, please? This shows you um, who benefits from all the different um, income assistance policies in kind and other that we have. Uh, and it's from, I believe it's calculated by the, uh, using census data by the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. And you can see that Social Security is our, our biggest pro uh, program in terms of poverty reduction, primarily for the aged, but also for 
adults who may receive disability or may retire before age 62, and also for children. But the largest one for children are the refundable tax credits. And this line here includes both the earned income tax credit and the child uh, tax credit that I mentioned earlier. You can see in the accompanying bar, uh, vertical bar chart on the other side uh, of the slide, uh, the, the difference in terms of uh, all people and children, the number listed out of poverty is 5.5 uh, million children, and 6.4 children made less poor. They're still poor, but less poor than they would have been without these two credits. So it's a really a, a significant, successful program, and uh, generally very, very well received on, uh, on bipartisan terms. Uh, can we look at the next slide, please? Here we can see uh, the states that have um, refundable EITCs and a few with non-refundable EITCs. It is the majority of states that have some kind of state earned income tax credit. They have their own requirements and eligibility and amounts, although some of them simply uh, piggyback on a federal uh, eligibility. And uh, you can still see there's, there's room for more states to take it on, including some states that uh, one would think ordinarily would have, such as maybe Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, Alaska, for example. Alaska does, of course, have their permanent fund, which goes to every adult and child who is a resident of Alaska, so perhaps that's why they don't have an EITC there. Um, but it's quite successful, and a number of um, people on our program are working on these uh, state-based uh, plans to try to include more states. And do we have a, another slide, Elise? Here is where you can go for more information. Uh, we're referring you to the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, uh, who does a fantastic job with all tax and budget issues, to the Census Bureau, and to the IRS, another great source for information about tax programs. So um, I hope this has provided you with some background. And it's um, now my pleasure to call on Rita Hamad. She's a social epidemiologist and family physician at the University of California, San Francisco, as I mentioned. Um, and uh, she is in the Institute for Health Policy Studies in the Department of Family and Community Medicine. She looks at how poverty and education and health disparities are linked over the life course, and she's a recipient of numerous awards. We are delighted to have you with us today, uh, Rita, and, and uh, please go ahead and start your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for the, the introduction, and thanks to the organizers at IWPR and UC Berkeley for inviting me to join this panel. I just realized I didn't update the date on this slide um, from when the session was first scheduled for, um, but that's okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think this is such a timely topic to be addressing in the current moment, um, both because of the need for policy solutions to address the socioeconomic fallout from the COVID pandemic and because social and economic policies are one potential lever to address longstanding racial and in particular black-white inequities by promoting programs and policies that benefit low-income communities of color. Uh, today I'm excited to share with you all the results of research from my team and others on the effects of the uh, EITC on child health. Next slide, please. As an overview of what I'll be covering today, first I'm going to outline the pathways linking poverty with health. And then I'm going to briefly describe some prior evidence on the effects of the EITC on health with a focus on what we know about kids. Uh, I'm then going to review the study design and results for the latest research project that my team has been working on. And I'll conclude with some implications of these findings for research advocacy and policymaking. Next slide, please. There are numerous pathways that might link poverty with health. Um, of course, poverty primarily manifests as low income and wealth, that top pathway, which limits uh, the ability to afford resources like healthy food, safe housing. This, in turn, can contribute to poor physical and mental health. Low income, of course, also limits the ability to access health care, which can worsen health. Poverty also leads to limited psychosocial resources. That is, it's well documented that chronic poverty can lead to stress, which contributes to limited cognitive bandwidth, as it's been termed. And this might lead people to make risky decisions around health behaviors like smoking or substance use. Uh, and rather than intervening downstream in healthcare settings or at the individual level, the goal of the EITC as an economic policy is to intervene upstream to target poverty itself at the population level. 
And the EICC is not intended necessarily as a health intervention. It's an economic policy. Poverty is the key determinant of health, and there have been several studies that document the EICC's health effects. Next slide, please. So in general, um, this existing evidence has shown positive effects of the EITC on health, although some results have been mixed. Keep in mind, the EITC is contingent on working, and recipients uh, often work in stressful, low-wage jobs, so we don't necessarily expect all health effects to be positive. Among adults, uh, several studies have found that the EITC reduces smoking and improves mental health. Yet there's also been evidence that the EITC might increase obesity and worsen metabolic markers, perhaps because the money is spent on increased purchase of unhealthy foods. Among kids, there are numerous studies that have examined birth outcomes, only a few of which I have the space to list here, and they've almost all demonstrated improvements in birth weight and related outcomes. Only a small number of studies examine outcomes in later childhood. Two of these found improvements in child development and test scores, and one found improvements in overall health. In terms of positive, uh, possible negative effects for child health, there has been one study that suggested an increase in very low birth weight among black moms in California. This finding has been contradicted in more recent work, and actually there have been three to four other studies that show that black mothers actually benefit more from the EITC in terms of birth outcomes. And unfortunately, the vast majority of the existing studies use historical data before the year 2000. And so, as Heidi mentioned, there's been an increase in the size of the EITC over time, as well as recent changes in the safety net uh, and more general policy environment. So more contemporary evidence is needed to inform ongoing state and federal policymaking. Next slide. <clears throat> One other key point to keep in mind is that the EITC is dispersed as a lump sum once a year as a tax refund. Uh, this figure shows the proportion of tax refunds received by month separately for EITC recipients, which is the dotted line, and all taxpayers, which is the solid line. So on the x-axis there, you have months of the year, January, February, March, et cetera. And on the y-axis is the proportion of tax refund payments being made. <clears throat> so you can see while many taxpayers, the solid line, wait until later in the tax season to file and potentially get their refunds, EITC recipients tend to file earlier, and it might be because they know that they are about to get this large refund, um, and so about 50% receive their refunds in February and nearly 30% in March. So there have been a few studies that have taken advantage of this pattern to look at whether the health of EITC recipients varies over the course of a year. <clears throat> These studies compare health outcomes in the months right after refund receipt with health outcomes measured later in the year in months more distant from refund receipt. And then uh, these studies can sort of subtract out any natural seasonal differences in these health outcomes that occur in non-EITC recipients. For those of you interested in the methods, um, I'll get into a bit more later on, but this is known as a difference in differences study design. And the reason this aspect of EITC is important is that it might help us better understand how large one-time payments affect health differently from more regular payments. And it also helps inform us about the volatility in health that might occur over the course of the year because of this design feature of the EITC policy. On the other hand, it might be that um, EITC recipients compensate for this lumpiness in income by smoothing their consumption. In other words, they might take out loans to meet their needs in the months prior to refund receipt so that maybe we won't see any health effects in the short term right after tax season. Next slide, please. So there aren't many studies that examine this question. Um, among adults, one study found improved food security, reduced smoking, and at the same time worsened metabolic markers in the months immediately after EITC refund receipt. Another study found that there were no short-term changes in healthcare spending right after EITC refund receipt. Um, this suggests that EITC recipients either smoothed their consumption of healthcare, so to speak, as I just described, or else that people don't tend to use EITC or tax refunds on healthcare. And there's been one study looking at the short-term effects of the EITC among kids, and this one found improved general health and no effects on a number of other outcomes. Again, this study used older data from the 1980s to 90s, so, so it's important to look at more recent evidence. Next slide, please. 
So this brings us to the research project I'll be describing today. The sample for this study was drawn from the National Health Interview Survey. This is a serial cross-sectional study. It interviews about 80,000 households a year, and it collects health data on one child per household. Importantly, it, it interviews individuals throughout the year, including both during tax season and in other months. And we use the survey waves from 1998 to 2016. In this analysis, we restricted it to families with income making less than $100,000, but more than zero, since other high-income families or unemployed families are, might not be an appropriate comparison group for EITC recipients. So the sample size for the study was ranged from 15,000 to 70,000, depending on what health outcome we were looking at, since the survey also asked different questions in different survey waves and different questions for kids of different ages. The main exposure for the study was the size of the EITC refund uh, for which somebody is eligible. And since the survey doesn't ask participants about their taxes, we calculated EITC refund sizes based on demographic information using IRS formulas. And we assumed that all individuals received the refund for which they're eligible. In reality, about 80% of people who are eligible for the EITC actually receive it. So while this results in some measurement error, it's sort of analogous to an intent to treat analysis for those who are familiar with that. Next slide, please. Our outcomes included measures of child nutrition and mental health that are thought to change in the short term in response to income. For nutrition, we use the USDA food security scale to capture food insecurity, as well as self-reported height and weight to calculate whether a child was overweight or underweight. For mental health, we use the mental health indicator, and this includes questions about whether the child is uncooperative, unhappy, or having sleep problems, and it's for children ages 2 to 3. And for older kids, age 4, four to 17, we use the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire, or SDQ, to evaluate for behavioral and emotional problems. Next slide, please. For those who are interested, again, the uh, analytic technique was difference in differences, and I'm going to explain what this method does using this figure, which is stylized and not based on our actual data. The x-axis is time, and the y-axis is the outcomes of interest. The area to the left of the dotted line is the period of the year when tax refunds are not received, and this method assumes that the trends or slopes and outcomes during this period are parallel between EITC recipients and non-recipients. Next slide. And then in February and April, when EITC recipients are re receiving their refunds, let's say that we observe this pattern for the two groups with an improvement in the outcome among EITC recipients in particular. So this method assumes that the trends and outcomes would have remained the same among the two groups in the absence of the EITC refund, and any observed difference is due to the treatment, which in this case is the lump sum EITC refund. Next slide, please. So here I have the results for the continuous outcomes, and this shows that uh, there was a reduction in food insecurity in the months after EITC refund receipt. It's equivalent to about 1% of a standard deviation, which is um, uh, per $1,000 of EITC received. And as a reminder, average refund size is about $3,000. And we didn't see any effect for the mental health indicator or strength and difficulties questionnaire. Next slide, please nor did we see a short-term effect on children's risk of being overweight or underweight. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so to summarize, uh, this most recent study found that the EITC results in modest improvements in food insecurity in the short term. And on the one hand, it's good news to know that this substantial income boost results in better food availability for families with kids. On the other hand, it also implies that food insecurity is worse in other parts of the year, so that the structure of the EITC may contribute to cyclical patterns in children's nutrition. So for these other outcomes for which we didn't uh, observe an effect, this might be because these outcomes are unlikely to change in the short term, uh, or it might be that parents tend to smooth consumption of relevant resources to protect kids. One possible policy implication of the findings for food insecurity is that the EITC could be distributed throughout the year rather than as a lump sum. Historically, this was an option, but fewer than 3% of EITC recipients took advantage of it. Also, we don't have studies comparing the health effects of these two different types of disbursement. Future studies could examine um, other health effects and could also um, examine other ways of delivering income, like increasing the minimum wage, which is dispersed through paychecks, throughout the year as opposed to a lump sum, or income supplements that are not contingent on employment. 
And again, all of this is especially important in the context of the fallout from COVID when there is a lot of interest in beefing up the safety net for vulnerable families. For example, would it have been more helpful to disperse more regular payments rather than the one-time stimulus checks that many families receive? Next slide. So I'd just like to thank my co-author on this manuscript, Akansha Batra, who's a PhD student at UCSF, and the funding sources, including the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the NIH, and pilot grants at UCSF. Next slide. Uh, that's it. Thanks. Rita, thank you very much. That was um, an excellent um, summary of your study, and we can see it does have an important impact. Um, next, we're going to call on, um, I believe it's uh, John Islin. He is a research fellow at the California um, Policy Lab, and he's going to be looking at the take-up of the earned income tax credit among uh, recipients in California. Go ahead, John. Thank you very much. Um, my name is John Islin, and I'm a research fellow at the California Policy Lab. Uh, the Policy Lab's mission is to partner with California's state and local governments to generate scientific evidence that solves California's most urgent problem. I want to pause here and acknowledge the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, Elijah McClain, and the many other black people who have been subject to racist attacks by the police that we have witnessed not just these past weeks, but for the entire history of our country. The work discussed in this presentation will not address these crimes, and I would not claim to propose a path to justice for them through improved tax policy. Our country's racist past and present both impacts all aspects of our lives, including the ways communities interact with social programs. One of my goals for our research is to give policymakers and advocates tools and information to improve policies that can directly empower marginalized individuals and communities. But at the same time, I want to acknowledge the violence that black communities are experiencing at this moment and state unequivocally that black lives matter. As policy scholars who earnestly care about improving the lives of others, we cannot accept and it is our duty to vehemently oppose such violence. I'm here to present work um, that I'm conducting alongside my co-author, Matt Unrath, who's a PhD student at the Goldman School of Public Policy at UC Berkeley, and is a part of a team at CPL that includes Professor Jesse Rothstein, Aparna Ramesh, and several others. We are attempting to provide a methodology for creating accurate state-level measures of EIDC eligibility among recipients of other social programs. In this presentation, I will explain a methodology which uses California administrative data to measure take-up of the EITC among CalFresh recipients which is the state instantiation of the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or food stamps. We find that combined federal and state take-up is approximately 70%, which means that 70% of eligible CalFresh households actually claim the ITC. The methods I will be presenting, the results I'll be presenting here are preliminary. And at the end of the talk, I will focus on an expanded methodology we are currently developing that will allow us to present EITC eligibility by race, language spoken, geography, and family structure. Uh, next slide, please. So we are concerned that many eligible households are missing out on the EITC benefit that they are owed. According to estimates from merged IRS census data, one in five eligible households do not claim the EITC. Now to construct this estimate, we need to know two things, who actually filed taxes and received the EITC, and second, the potential eligibility among non-filers, individuals who didn't file taxes in a given year. Current estimates at the federal level use IRS tax records to determine the first component and use census survey data for the second. However, these methods can be used to estimate a state's EIDC supplement and must work within the limitations of census records, including measurement error. Most of the take-up gap seems to be driven, given current research, by eligible non-filers or low-income households who do not file taxes because their income falls below the filing threshold, depicted here for a head-of-household tax unit, but would be eligible for benefit if they were to file taxes. Uh, next slide, please. This is a particular concern in California, where the state EITC supplement, which we refer to as the Cal EITC, is loaded on low-income filers. This is unusual in the world of state EITC supplements. Established in 2015, rather than providing a fixed percentage on top of the federal EITC as in other states, the Cal EITC focuses benefits on lower-income tax units. Because, of the, because the bulk of the, those eligible for the Cal EITC are below the filing threshold, again depicted in this figure for head of household filers, we might be more concerned about low take-up inhibiting individuals and families from claiming their Cal EIDC benefit. Next slide, please. 
we combined several sources of administrative data from California to attempt to estimate the take-up rate of the federal and state EIPC among the CalFresh population. First, we obtained annual tax records from 2015 through 2018 from the California Franchise Tax Board. We have data on 33 million unique individuals in 2017, including their income and tax composition. Second, we obtained eight years of monthly CalFresh enrollment data from the California Department of Social Services, covering around 5.6 million individuals per year. In these data, we can observe demographics, geographic location, and who is on a case with whom month to month, giving us a glimpse at household composition. Finally, we have UI covered earnings, or wage income covered by the unemployment insurance program for all individuals on CalFresh. We merged these three data sets together to create a complete picture of both tax filers and non-filers in California who claim CalFresh. Now, we believe that CalFresh provides a good snapshot of the low-income population in California. When we look at the demographic and economic characteristics of CalFresh and non-CalFresh um, recipients in the American Community Survey, a census data set, we see that there's a similar distribution of race and wages across both recipients and non-recipients. However, households that receive CalFresh tend to be larger with more young children, indicating that EIDC eligibility might be more likely among CalFresh households as opposed to non-CalFresh households with the same income. In addition, it's worth noting that CalFresh recipients must have a social security number, which is also an eligibility criteria for the EITC. It's worth noting that this means that it means that this eligibility criteria for both programs excludes individuals without an SSN from receiving benefits for either. Um, may we see the next slide? Thank you. For now, I will be presenting results first published by Elizabeth Minos, Aparna Ramesh, Jesse Rothstein, and Matt Unrath earlier this year. And they found a combined federal and state take-up rate of 70%, indicating that out of likely filing units that the authors imputed as eligible for the ITC, only 70% actually claimed either the federal or state credit. Now, this is on the lower end of the range of state-level IRS census estimates. But given the difference in the samples, it is reasonably close. When we assume similar rates of underlying eligibility among filers and non-filers, we see that filers are eligible for larger dollar amounts than non-filers. They appear to be eligible for an average combined federal and state benefit of $3,122 versus non-filers who are eligible for $1,819. This likely reflects both the difference in household composition and earnings. However, non-filers could be eligible for the ITC at lower rates than filers, which would mean the credit Mean, would mean a lower mean credit amount among this population. Next slide, please. We can also look at the distribution of income between filers and non-filers, UI covered earnings. Most non-filers on CalFresh have income below the single and married filing thresholds. 77% have estimated earned income below $10,400 versus only 42% of filers. Now, while the bulk of non-filers have low earnings, this does not negate the possibility that there are still parents with children who would be owed to substantial credit amounts, especially given the CalEITC's Cal focus on lower income tax units. Central to producing these estimates is the process of converting CalFresh households, those who eat meals together, into tax units. There are a series of assumptions implicit in the results I have presented to you. When creating tax units, the authors assumed, A, that all individuals on a CalFresh case would appear on the same potential tax unit, and B, that all, cal all children in the CalFresh case would qualify as children for the purposes of EITC eligibility. To better understand what money is left on the table and who, is, who it is owed to, we wanted to go a step further to produce more precise estimates of tax unit composition. Can we see the next slide? We are currently working on the following improved methodology. We want to assign each individual to the CalFresh case that they were on for the most months during the year. Within each case, we would impute who is likely to be a head or a spouse on the tax unit versus who is likely to be a dependent. We would then marry imputed heads together if they appear on a case and we observe them together on a prior year tax return or if they are of a similar age. We assign imputed dependents to these adults based on either prior year tax records or if they meet a number of age and income criteria. We then classify these dependents as qualifying children for the EITC based on their age and the number of months they spent on a CalFresh case. With this imputed tax unit, we used UI covered earnings to impute EITC eligibility and benefits amount. Next slide, please. Now, we believe that this procedure can be used to improve 
our ability to construct accurate tax units using administrative data. In particular, we can observe the amount of time a dependent is on the same CalFresh case as a tax filer, which allows us to estimate the residency requirement for being a qualified children, child for the ITC. However, there are a few issues with our methodology as it currently stands that we're working on right now. The first is we can observe self-employment income. This means that we may be misestimating EIDC eligibility for tax units whose self-employment income will either push them into or out of eligibility. Second, we are trying to identify cases where a potential individual should be on a tax return, but that individual, either a child or an adult, does not appear within the CalFresh data. This is problematic because we may be misestimating marital status or missing earned income that should be applied to the tax unit when we are missing an adult. And we may be misestimating the number of dependents or qualified children that should be attached to a tax unit when we are missing a child. Our future goals for this research are to improve the procedure for estimating tax unit composition, then produce estimates of both federal and state take EITC take-up rates, the total dollars outstanding, and the number of households who are eligible for the EITC and not claiming the credit. And we hope to produce these estimates by race, language spoken, household composition, and geographies. And our goal is to provide state policymakers, researchers, and advocates more information regarding who is currently not receiving the benefits to which they are entitled, and ideally help craft policy to make sure everyone is able to receive the benefits that they are owed. Thank you very much. Uh, John, thank you very much. Um, a very interesting presentation. I've often wondered about uh, people who don't uh, file, and I was surprised to see they would be eligible for as much as uh, $2,000 here. Um, so very interesting. Also, thank you for your comments about um, racism in our society, and I, I thank Rita as well for mentioning the COVID crisis. Right now, we are in the middle of three crises, of course, um, the social justice crisis, which has, of course, been longstanding, uh, more short-term has been the COVID um, epidemic, pandemic, and also um, the economic freefall that has occurred from that. And I believe that our next speaker Adam Rubin, who is a campaign director at the Economic Security Project, is going to be telling us a little bit about uh, what we might be able to do about that issue. So it's wonderful that we, we have all of these um, crises at least being spoken about today. Uh, Adam has a long um, history in organizing, and he's now with a project that does both organizing and research. So, Adam, uh, thank you very much, and please start. Great. Thanks so much, Heidi. Um, I'm excited to be doing this panel because <clears throat> I think that the EITC is a particularly powerful tool for promoting health and economic well-being all the time, and a particularly good tool during recession. Uh, and I'll talk um, about how that's true and some of the design changes that could make it even stronger um, and improve its effects during this time, and, and then share some updates about what's happening in Washington with this issue. Um, so on the first slide, I think EITC um, is important in good times for its economic and health outcomes, and its positive effects can be even more pronounced during a recession. Um, we heard from Rita about some of the positive health impact during normal times. Um, it's also a recession fighter with pronounced positive impacts during economic downturns. Um, the Tax Policy di Center uh, did a recent paper that we supported showing that the EITC acts as a modest automatic stabilizer during recessions. And even if we do nothing, as some people's income drops and more people are eligible for the EITC, it will provide health and economic benefits to those hit hardest and at the same time boost the overall economy. And by strengthening it, we can improve those impacts. I think it's significant that this is a public policy with a history of bipartisan support, um, and that also improves its prospects in this time. Um, the next slide. Um, this is um, a this is an unusual recession. Um, it's caused by a global pandemic, which has profound impacts not only on health and well-being, but also on traditional work and work incentives. Um, I guess I got one behind on my slide, so let's jump. One more slide, please. Um, obviously, unemployment um, has skyrocketed, um, even despite the positive but questionable numbers that were released a few weeks ago. We continue to have about a million and a half people filing new unemployment claims, um, and the uh, economic impact is not equally distributed. 
40% of households earning under $40,000 have lost jobs. So unemployment is most heavily concentrated among low-wage workers and people in the bottom uh, part of the income spectrum. 27 million people have lost job-sponsored health insurance. So aside from unemployment, you know, people who are eligible for unemployment insurance um, and that's trying to make up their wages, uh, tens of millions have lost health insurance at the same time. And frankly, that number is about six weeks old, so it's almost certainly greater now. And it, this is worse, unsurprisingly, for black and brown Americans. Uh, the uh, COVID health impacts are, of course, worse, um, and the economic impacts are, are worse um, for black and Native American and Latinx families. Just one statistic that I find jaw-dropping, the number of black business owners has plummeted by 41% since the recession began. So uh, even the economic impacts um, are concentrated even among better off components of the black community. Um, the next slide, um, the EITC is traditionally structured as a work incentive. Um, and at a time like this, when so many people are struggling, it's positioned well to both boost financial security to help me, people meet their basic needs and to help people get back to work and get back on their feet as the economy recovers. Um, in the next slide, there are four major expansions that I'm gonna walk through that we think are important to consider as temporary changes to make the EITC more responsive to this recession. And this comes from work that we've done over the past three years in developing the um, EITC expansion and modernization proposal that we call the cost of living refund. Um, and so we've sort of pulled out some of those things, those ideas that were good ideas before, but are particularly valuable um, in this moment, in this economic crisis. Um, the first is to expand to uh, people who are not eligible, family caregivers and low income college students, and to younger and older workers who don't have kids at home who are not eligible today, um, to um, boost the credit uh, for people who suffer significant income drops and uh, expand out the eligibility and to change the way the credit is, credit is administered to help those who need help now rather than at tax time next year. Um, so let me, I'm going to walk through those one by one. Next slide. Um, the first is to recognize the crucial role of family caregiving during the pandemic. So as you've heard, the EITC rewards work. You have to work for what you get with the EITC. Um, and the only work that it counts, counts is paid income from a job in the formal economy. Um, but it doesn't count the essential work that is both kind of morally valuable and worthwhile and essential to our society of those who are taking care of a young child or a sick parent. Many women, especially women of color, will fall out of the paid workforce and into unpaid family caregiving as a result of this pandemic and recession. And frankly, if schools aren't open in person full time in the fall, um, and it seems like many children will continue to be home in the fall, many seniors aren't going to be in senior centers because those have become dangerous places from a health perspective um, in, in nursing homes. Um, that will continue to be true or be, become true even at a larger level. Um, as businesses reopen and women are not able to go back to jobs. It has never been clearer that it's essential that we recognize caregiving as valuable and essential work that we should reward by making caregivers eligible for the EITC. Um, next slide. The next thing we need to do is to make the credit bigger and broader to get it to more people who need it. Um, we need to raise the income limits, so push it further up the income spectrum to catch folks who are uh, we're struggling along in the economy. The folks who said before this recession, I'm doing okay today, but I'm one car accident away from disaster. The 40% of Americans who couldn't afford a $400 emergency, and for many people, this recession has been that $400 emergency week after week. So we need to go further up the income spectrum to capture people who are doing a little bit better, but struggling with no safety net or living with no safety net and whose incomes have now fallen. We need to increase the credit amounts, the amount of money that you get from your EITC, particularly for workers without children, without dependent children. Um, and uh, we need to allow credits for adults of all ages, including students. Um, 
we also need to include immigrant taxpayers, um, whether or not they are undocumented. Um, and uh, it's a really exciting and positive development that a lot of organizations have been working on together for a long time. In the last two weeks, um, we've kind of broken the seal on that policy as for first, uh, both Colorado and California have led the way on making this change at the state level, including undocumented people who are already paying taxes and saying that they should be eligible for the, uh, the EITC as their tax refund as well. Um, the next slide, we need to um, reduce the risk of undermining families who are most in need by accelerating or eliminating the phase-in. So if you picture back to the slide that Heidi showed at the beginning where the EIT is phased in, it has that slope on the left side of the graph. Families get about 40 cents on the, um, for every dollar they earn up until they reach the maximum credit amount, although those with, without kids get much less. And that structure, structure is designed to incentivize people to work. The more you work, the more you get. Um, we need to accelerate that rate in a recession. Um, make a temporary change that says you should get for every dollar of earnings, you should get a full dollar of credit. Um, that will push more money to people who are in deep poverty. Um, and it will ensure that families who have lost significant income and were higher up on the curve, but now are kind of thrown into that phase in range, won't also lose more, most or all of their EITC at the same time. Also, I think the sort of politics of this are interesting. Those who want to provide strong incentives to people to get back to work right now um, will also find that putting, making this change, accelerating the phase in um, changes, increases that incentive as well. Next slide. Um, the, the fourth category of changes is we need to um, deliver the credits more effectively. Um, the tax credits are only useful if people get them. Um, as uh, John and Rita talked about, one in five people who've earned the IT, EITC never get it because the process of filing for it is difficult and cumbersome. Most EITC recipients use paid tax preparers who take two to $400 out of their EITC refunds to help people fill out the complicated IRS forms. So we need two reforms here. Um, we need automatic filing, sending the EITC automatically to everyone for whom the IRS has earnings information. And we need options for periodic payments to help everybody who's eligible get credits when they need them. That's a solution to the problem that Rita pointed out where there's that income spike in February and then many EITC recipients rely on payday loans at other points throughout the year. Nearly all EITC recipients use a chunk of their EITC when they get it in February to pay off debt that they got in to get to that point. So um, we need to let people smooth it, um, spread it out throughout the year so their incomes are less volatile. And an advance on next, the next year's EITC would also give people more help now in this crisis. Um, next slide. Here's what's happening in Washington right now. Um, the uh, House passed the HEROES Act last month which includes some expansions to the EITC. So again, this is passed by the House, but not yet passed by the Senate or addressed by the Senate. Uh, temporary expansion and increased credit amount for childless workers, um, an age expansion down to age 19 and up to age 66, although it doesn't include college students, um, to account for the possibility of families losing their EITC because of lost jobs or wages, it allows recipients to elect to use their 2019 income instead of their 2020 income for eligibility if their 2020 income has dropped. And a few permanent changes such as changing eligibility for families with qualifying children without social security numbers and for separated spouses and a few other small things. Um, but um, uh, la last slide please. Um, but we need to do more. Um, particularly, we need to expand the universe for eligible households. Um, and there's a strong argument right now for um, that even in these short-term solutions, some of the kinds of expansions we're talking about, like family caregiving, are important. Um, several lawmakers have championed many of these modernizations, many of the policy changes that we're talking about even before the crisis. Um, Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, uh, Sherrod Brown, um, Rashida Tlaib, uh, Bonnie Watson Coleman, Gwen Moore, um, some of the folks, the policymakers in Congress who have um, talked uh, about these issues 
uh, before the crisis and continue to be some of those who are most outspoken on it uh, during the crisis. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much, Adam. Now I'm going to turn to Otis Rowley. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He is an urbanist. He is now with the Rockefeller Foundation. He came to them from uh, directing one of their projects called 100 Resilient Cities. Foundations are always stealing from their grantees. And um, he also <laughs> has a strong background working for many cities, um, including Newark and my home state, New Jersey, And although I'm from the Jersey Shore, Otis. And um, he's held cabinet roles with five different mayors in three large U.S. cities. He has a master's in city planning from MIT, and he graduated with honors uh, from Rutgers University. Uh, Otis, your turn. Thank you very much for being with us. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Uh, and, and Jersey Shore still counts. So uh, um, uh, um, I wanted to, uh, uh, to just thank everyone just for the, the chance to talk a little bit uh, from the foundation space uh, on this important topic. Um, today I'll be speaking about the Rockefeller Foundation's Equity and Economic Opportunity Initiative. Um, and we at the EEO team are really proud to, to fund numerous state and national organizations that are shaping this conversation around the earned income tax credit and the state and at the state and federal levels. Uh, the foundation has a long history of uh, supporting research uh, as a means to affect change in policy. Um, but beyond just the research, we are um, actively engaged in, in advocacy and, and education and really are hopeful that the policy changes that need to occur will occur to, to affect a real uh, substantial change. Especially in this time um, and date, uh, as was previously mentioned, we're dealing with the multiple pandemics, uh, structural systemic racism um, that has been in place for such a long time and, and from the very beginnings of this country, and, and COVID-19. Um, and while a vaccine may be um, around the corner, potentially as it relates to COVID-19, we know uh, that the, um, the cure related to structural and systemic racism will be a little bit harder. Uh, it has been harder uh, for us to, to uh, find a cure for, uh, uh, or to, at least to apply uh, the cure for. We know that the cure um, is, is, uh, is really around education. It is around uh, valuing human lives, uh, regardless of, of race, creed, sex, um, sexual orientation, um, place of origin, or, or ability. Um, and so we want to do everything that we can at the foundation to advance that work, and part of that work is in the policy area. Um, so um, next slide, please. The, the equity and economic opportunity team is, is led by a single vision. We believe that every person in the United States uh, who works should be able to meet the basic needs of their families and have a path to, to a better future. Next slide. Um, sadly, 40 years ago, a worker could cover a family of four's major annual expenditures, you know, housing, health care, transportation, et cetera, on 30 weeks of salary. Today, it takes about 53 weeks. Uh, and yes, you're doing your math right, that's oh, more than a year. According to the, the United Way, 28% of U.S. households live above the federal poverty line, um, yet Alice, asset limited, income constrained, and employed, Alice workers, these households even more um, uh, than the federal policy level, yet still struggle to make ends meet. Together, um, with the 14% of households living below the federal poverty line, uh, the 42% of U.S. households cannot make ends meet. Um, in 2018, the average gap between earnings and survival costs for households below the hours threshold was 50%. Next slide. In America, the United Way classifies around 90 million Americans as Alice. Those, again, are asset-limited, income-constrained, and employed. They literally do not have enough to make ends meet. And so we, we know that 83% of them live in cities, and, which is why our place-based work uh, focuses in, in urban areas. 69% uh, are in their prime working age, between 25 and 54, and 62% are people of color the majority of which are Latinx and African American. This is our target population, and these are the individuals and families that we had in mind when we set our vision. Next slide, please. As a private foundation, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation is prohibited from engaging in lobbying. However, uh, the foundation uh, is able to really resource, 
um, and aid in the providing of information that will help inform the public, the media, and policymakers on important issues of, of public policy. We can do advocacy and education, but, uh, but no lobbying as a private foundation. Next slide, please. The EITC boosts, uh, we know that EITC boosts the income of 9 million women of color, African American, Latinx, Native American women together um, make up about 65% share of the women who are receiving um, EITC. Next slide. We also know, as has been uh, partially communicated by some of the previous speakers, uh, we know that three out of five people um, who are on it um, are only on it for a year or two, um, but it's a proven ladder up. It promotes work, uh, and, and fuels the economy, it expands economic security, and as this slide illustrates, it promotes economic mobility as well. An individual who is a recipient, uh, and it's born within the uh, family who's a recipient, they will have improved infant health, they will do better in school, they're more likely to um, enroll in college, have increased earnings, and um, and then have greater social security benefits. So data and research shows us this, um, and we know it to be true. Next slide, please. Uh, so when we look at our work and the goals of the grant making and investing that we can do, we've tried to really kind of focus in on knowing these health benefits um, and overall benefits of EITC. Uh, we've tried to focus in on kind of three core areas, um, adoption and expanding um, and improving state EITC, um, increasing federal funding, and modernizing tax filing uh, process. Next slide, please. At the state level, uh, we've funded four states directly and 10 others through pooled funds, uh, part of an integrated strategy at the state and national level to, to achieve our goals. Our funding support uh, to our partners include leveraging uh, tech-enabled innovation design for the end user to increase access, improve quality, and yield better outcomes, investing in the capacity of policy organizations and coalitions uh, that seek to improve the economic stability of workers. We're promoting the use of data to inform legislation and to really try to measure impact. And we're investing in social and behavioral science to understand how policies, even beyond EITC and CTC, can lead to economic stability and mobility. Next slide, please. ITEP, which supports state coalitions, uh, is supported by the Rockefeller Foundation and is doing specific work in Washington, Missouri, uh, Illinois, Arkansas, Georgia, and New Jersey. Um, ITEP is helping to use uh, micro simulation tax modeling to conduct complex data analysis of proposed uh, and enacted tax changes. Tax changes. Um, it's helping partners advocate for tax reforms that raise equitable and sustainable revenues uh, that will boost incomes of low and moderate income households. And it's working to really give partners uh, leverage to defeat or weaken fiscally unsound proposals. In an environment where policymakers are making significant tax policy decisions with little or no information on the equity or adequacy uh, implications uh, that their choices will have on their constituents or the ability to fund public investment, this grantee is, is working to really um, fill those information gaps, and particularly at the state level. Its, its analysis is showing how tax proposals will affect taxpayers at different income levels, um, um, by, uh, including by race, um, um, and, and also doing a lot to really try to provide um, the relevant information and data sources that people would need to, to just make a wiser decision. Next slide. At the, at the national level, we're following the same principle around advancing data, science, capacity building, and innovation. Um, we've pooled our resources with other earned income tax credit funders, network, um, leveraging resources for var from various other foundations. Um, and just really pleased to be working with, with many different grantees at, at the national level, um, including uh, EFP, um, Adam has talked earlier, and, um, and I'll be talking a little bit later also about uh, CBPP. Um, and in and, and our first year, we've, we've partnered with some really substantial national coalitions, um, traditional such as the Center for Budget Policy um, Priorities and, um, and EFP, um, and also some non-traditional in the tax and public policy space, such as UNIDUS, um, and formerly known as La Raza, Moms Rising, and the ARC. Next slide, please. At the national level, the Center for Budget po and Policy Priorities, CBPP, 
has produced some rigorous research to advocate for changes for EITC. They're doing some awesome work in expanding the EITC for working people um, who are, who are, um, are not necessarily, who don't necessarily have children, um, increasing the EITC for families with children, um, and improving the child tax credit so it, it doesn't leave out millions of low-income children. Next slide. COVID-19 has dramatically shifted legislative priorities at the state and federal level. So while social distancing controls create constraints for the legislative process, the pandemic has brought issues of economic opportunity um, and equitability to the fore and necessitated relief for working people and their families. So while the Rockefeller Foundation continues to advance its long-term strategy to expand and adopt state EITC, increasing federal funding and modernizing the tax filing process, um, one of our grants to CBP's state priority partners, SPP Network, um, will actually support the research capacity of state policy think tanks throughout the COVID response phase, particularly in a way to, to guard um, and protect um, and do some defensive work uh, to ensure that organizations have the data and the resources that they need so they can pr play a crucial and critical role um, as many states are facing uh, budget, that budget shortfall. So finally, next slide, please. Uh, just in terms of takeaways um, from the foundation perspective, um, you know, uh, the way that we view it for EITC is, um, and CTC is listed just millions of workers and families out of poverty, um, and yet many are excluded and receive only small amounts from these credits. And so our grant dollars are really trying to go to supporting coalitions that, that shape policy debates, um, policy research and analysis that will help uh, to make sure less people are excluded that, um, and that those who are included um, receive more funds uh, in terms of these federal benefits. Um, alongside with other interventions, we firmly do believe that EITC can help support workers and their families um, in the wake of COVID-19 um, and in, into the future. So thank you so much for, for the opportunity to, uh, to share a little bit of what the Rockefeller Foundation is, is doing um, and, and how that uh, we see EITC as being critical to the physical and economic health of, of working Americans. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Otis. A very good overview of all that is happening across the country, country in this domain, uh, thanks to you and other foundations. Uh, I want to take a minute while you're all thinking of questions uh, to go back to John Islin and tell you about some of his qualifications, which I neglected to do. My piece of paper was in the wrong place. He graduated with a master's degree in public policy from the Goldman School of Public Policy at UC Berkeley recently. Uh, prior to that, he worked four years at the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center, and he has a bachelor's in economics from Reed College. And I believe he told me that he will be now moving on to uh, earning his Ph.D. in economics. Um, thank you again, John, and thank you, everyone, for a, a most interesting set of presentations. Um, so I'm... I uh, now want to um, turn this over to Jeff Hayes to um, moderate the questions that I hope you all have. Uh, we'd like to get um, questions and comments from you about perhaps what you're doing with the EITC, what your research might show, uh, what your advocacy might be. Uh, so, uh, Jeff, let me turn it over to you. Thanks. Great. I, thank you, everyone. That was really good. Really very interesting to hear more details about it and about the impact and all so that was great. Um, the first question we got was that um, full-time students under 24 years old can be claimed by their parents at the EITC if they meet the income requirements. How would the expansion you mentioned, just as a suggested Adam, specifically for students interact with the current credit structure? Um, students who are supported by their parents can be claimed as uh, dependents, uh, but many students are not supported by their parents. Um, they're on their own. They're putting themselves through school. They're not getting any or not getting much support from family, and uh, they're struggling. And, and this is, you know, the case before the um, recession where there are startling statistics about the percentage of students, and this is particularly true at community colleges who experience food insecurity uh, or who spend time living in their cars. And so uh, 
much like with the idea of family caregivers saying, well, even if you don't have earned income from a paid job in the formal economy, you're doing something of value uh, for your family, for your community, and we have to reward that by giving you a minimum EITC amount. We should do the same with low-income students, not wealthier students who are being supported by their parents, but those who don't have other resources. Uh, for example, those who are eligible for Pell Grants um, would be eligible for a minimum credit in the EITC. Great, thank you. Um, and also, I think for Adam, you mentioned uh, uh, some research on positive support for EITC offered during the COVID-19 crisis. Could you um, talk a little more about that? The person is working on a similar project and was very interested. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly what piece of it that refers to, but um, I guess I would say, so the, uh, the House bill included some expansion of the EITC. Um, there's conversation now as Congress is thinking about what to do. The Senate's going to come back and discuss it. There's going to be a negotiation soon. Um, the, the conversation is actively happening uh, in the kind of public debate, the advocacy, advocacy community, as well as among policymakers about what we ought to do. And I think the baseline of conversation is um, looking at a uh, temporary increase for childless workers and age expansion and some of these other small uh, technical fixes. Um, but uh, I think the opportunity is to do more, to use the EITC as a more powerful uh, tool and to make some of these kinds of fixes and how it's administered to make sure that everybody who's eligible is actually getting it and that the money is moving more quickly into people's pockets to help them meet the economic struggles that they're facing today. Okay, um, we got a little more information. <laughs> Great. Um, and they're trying to think about, they're doing healthcare consulting um, looking at EITC as a policy recommendation for federal agencies to better support direct service workers, nursing assistants, personal care aides, and others, supporting those with disabilities and aging adults and individuals with mental, and mental health and mm -hmm. issues um, who often receive low wage and low benefits. So um, anything more about um, assistance aimed at direct care workers? Um, yeah, first just to make a distinction between the, um, the caregiver credit that I'm talking about is really aimed at family caregivers who don't earn income from their caregiving and in many cases because they're caring for someone aren't working at all, don't have any income and don't, therefore don't qualify for any EITC at all. Um, but I think uh, it is, you're exactly right that um, care work for those um, in the paid economy um, is poorly compensated by and large, mostly provided by women of color, um, and that those are critical audiences for the um, EITC. Um, I think increasing the amount of the EITC, making it available on a periodic basis, making sure that everyone who is eligible gets it through automatic filing um, and giving people the opportunity to get it as an advance against next year's credit. If someone is laid off right now uh, and they're going to get the EITC next February, but they're struggling for food right now, um, those are some of the, um, the modernizations that I think particularly would benefit someone in that kind of situation. Great. Thank Hi, you. Heidi, I, I have... Um a comment or something I'd love to hear the panel think about. I know we're hearing, uh, not surprisingly, a lot more about the basic um, income proposals in the current environment. We're all worried. Uh, IWPR, myself included, did a report on how technological change will affect women. And uh, we looked at retail trade and we said, yeah, you know, it's changing, but, you know, maybe not that rapidly. Uh, same with office work. And now we have a situation where Technology is probably um, advanced, as someone said, a decade in the time of the COVID crisis because so many firms are going to move to automation as much as they can and people have moved to online buying 
uh, online buying and fantastic numbers. So uh, we're going to have big changes in the economy. And uh, basic income is something that, uh, well, one of our presidential candidates on the Democratic side talked about. I think the Economic Security Project might be looking at it. It's, it's something that could be added uh, to the to the EITC to take care of these many people that don't qualify. So, you know, instead of having students or home care, uh, those who are providing unpaid care at home get an EITC, which I'm not against. I mean, maybe they would get both. Uh, they could, people who aren't covered by the EITC could be covered uh, by a universal basic income. Uh, so I, I just wondered, if, is there work out there on how those two programs might combine basic income with the earned income tax credit? Yeah, this is Adam, and I think you're exactly putting your finger on something really important. Um, the To sort of step up one level, um, we think about it like what we're really talking about here is cash. Cash is a tool of helping people alongside, not as a replacement for other essential safety net programs, cash transfers can give people uh, the most flexibility, give people the tools to solve their own problems, and give recipients freedom and dignity that they have the tools to meet their family's basic needs. And the direct stimulus payments, the economic impact payments um, authorized by the CARES Act are one version of that. Um, the uh, other kinds of proposals like a UBI or guaranteed income, um, like the ones that you referenced, or another version of that, and the EITC is, has been so successful because it's another version of uh, something that gives people the flexibility to say, uh, to decide what's the most urgent problem that they face. There is no other government program for uh, my kid needs shoes this month and uh, or food this month and my mom needs medicine next month and then the next month my transmission broke but I need my car in order to get to my job and maintain my income. Um, so that's the through line uh, in what you're discussing. And the only other thing I'd add is I think it's really important in this moment of the kind of reckoning of racial injustice that we're going through or that we're acknowledging finally uh, more broadly in this country um, to note that the, uh, this has been a core uh, element of uh, racial justice vision for a long time since Dr. King, who called for a guaranteed job and a guaranteed income. Um, and that historic um, connection has uh, exists today as the movement for black lives is calling for uh, uh, basic income as part of their economic security investing in communities platform um, as a response to the uh, crisis of economic injustice that we're seeing. Yeah, very good. I've been a strong believer in cash. I, I remember one time when I um, had a meeting with the USA Today full editorial board, um, and uh, it was about poverty, and I said, well, you know, there's a really good way to solve poverty. I said, we just have to give people money so they get above the poverty line. And, I mean, you could have seen the jaws drop around the table, uh, every single one. Yeah. Shocked. And I said, well, this is what happens in European countries. Uh, I, I don't see why we can't do it here. And, you know, the, the culture of poverty stuff just became so strong for such a long period of time that, you know, the the willingness to allow families to die and individuals to make their own judgments with cash, you know, was really um, whittled away, especially for single uh, black mothers whose, you know, cash grants under AFDC or whatever we're calling it these days uh, – is virtually completely gone. Hardly anyone is even on that program anymore. Uh, so we we definitely undermine the selfhood of people on that program, and it's lucky in a way that we have something the EITC that that can help people with cash. But I really think, given the you know long run economic and technological changes we're going to see, we're we're going to need to be um, thinking about that how we can add the basic income elements in order to bring people, you know, more cash that they need. But it's a very, very interesting <laughs> way to look at it. So thank you for giving us a universal this is, denominator. This is Rita. I was going to add one other thing. 
um, which is that it, it's interesting for a lot of safety net policies in the United States, people tend to get up in arms when anyone suggests a work requirement, like for uh, Medicaid to provide health insurance to low-income individuals, or SNAP benefits to provide the um, food vouchers. Um, and so people get very upset because there's an acknowledgement there that that for very vulnerable individuals, you don't want them necessarily going out into the workplace that might that could potentially worsen their health. And so, and so for for a number of safety net benefits, we as a society um, are are less inclined to have a work requirement. But yet, for some reason, as as you guys are saying, around cash um, uh, cash support, uh, there's still this expectation that that some that people um, be employed uh, and it and it you know neglects all of the context of families um, who have those caregiving responsibilities or school or or for whatever reason you know have have um, challenges in in their labor market um, and so I think that is again with with what that, what's happening with COVID um, and, uh, that maybe there are changes on that horizon to bring the United States more in line with other high-income countries where where that that expectation isn't there. Yeah, this is Adam. I think that's really interesting, um, and uh, something quite frankly surprising um, happened as part of the CARES Act when it passed at the end of March, um, which was that. Uh, direct payments to individuals have been part of responses to previous recessions in, I think, 2001 and 2008 and 9, um, but they've always had a work requirement attached to them, which is kind of bananas if you think about it, so, like at the time when jobs are vanishing to say, we're going to provide payments to people, but only if they were working before, that's how you know they're quote unquote worthy and would be eligible for these stimulus payments. Well, this time around for the first time ever, Stimulus payments went to people, even with zero income, um, a recognition that those who are the, in the most dire economic circumstances needed help to get through this crisis. And we had even a few Republicans who were um, pushing when an earlier proposal said it was going to, you know, you were going to have, there was going to be a phase in just like the EITC on those direct stimulus payments. Even some Republicans uh, joined with Democrats in saying, we need to help everyone survive. We need to help everyone meet their basic needs because they're human, not because they proved their worth through work. So it, the, the work um, incentive is baked into the DNA of the EITC. And, um, you know, I think that's part of why it's had bipartisan support over time. Um, but looking at some of the ways that you can move more money to people further down the economic ladder um, more money to families, particularly with children in deep, deep poverty. Um, it, it will be interesting to see whether any of those kinds of attitudinal shifts that we're seeing in this moment of crisis persist. Yeah, good, good point. Josh, do we have any more uh, comments or questions? Because I no more have come in, Heidi, and we're about at time. So. Right, so I was just going to give uh, Otis and John a chance for a final remark before I thank everyone. Otis? Um, nothing to further to add, only that uh, this, this continues to be, I think, just an important uh, tax and, and budget policy uh, that uh, just clearly shows the, the multiple benefits um, that if we do it the right way with a focus on, on equity um, and, and increasing access, this is the type of work that we need to do. And I'm, I'm just excited that the foundation gets the opportunity to, to work with so many phenomenal uh, grants grantees uh, who are doing the right work, such as Adam at, at ESP. So um, that's the only thing else that I would add. Well, thank you, Otis. Um, how about you, John? Yeah, um, I just wanted to uh, say on, on the topic of the stimulus payments, like, and just as with the ITC, uh, receipt of those payments was conditional on your interaction with the tax system, which in many ways is a function of the income you have. Um, according to a CBCP estimate, about 12 million non-filers who would be eligible for stimulus payments aren't likely to receive them unless there's aggressive state-level outreach um, because of their non-interaction with the tax system. So even when we start moving into um, attempts to do outreach not conditional on income, it will, the more we do that, the more we're going to have to reckon with ways in which the tax system 
interacts with or has it interacts with particular individuals that we want to be able to help. And that's a problem we're seeing with the COVID payments. And it's a problem that I think we need to be conscious of as we design policies going forward. That's a, a very good point. With Social Security, we uh, there was a victory, so to speak, in expansion of the stimulus check by saying everyone who gets it can get the stimulus check without having to file for taxes because many people who receive only Social Security don't file for taxes. They don't owe any taxes, so they don't file, and they're not eligible for an EITC either or child tax credit, so they don't file. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent point that we have to make our um, mm -hmm. uh, people more engaged in our yeah. system or make that system extremely more flexible. So and, I want well, to thank well, Social Security was included. Oh. Go ahead. Oh, but, no, it's quite all right. Uh, just while Social Security was included, other programs like Medicaid and SNAP, um, some of these issues still persist. That, that's right, yeah. Um, so I just want to move on now to thanking everyone, all our presenters who I think did a brilliant job, and our participants for uh, staying with us for our hour and 15 minutes. And I want to thank our staff again, Elise Shaw, who coordinates this series, the, uh, Lee, Lee Woods, who is our communications person, and Jeff Hayes, our uh, senior researcher with the, uh, our, our joint project with Berkeley and our partners again, Berkeley, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and Urban Institute. Uh, thank you all very much, and uh, we'll let you know if we're going to have future webinars next fall. Uh, we've really enjoyed the uh, two semesters of webinars that we've done, and we've enjoyed meeting so many of you uh, who are participating in them and who are participating as audiences as well. Thank you so much. <laughs>